pressure looks good. Hey, greetings everyone. We are here today for a, a little bit of, this one's better, a little bit of NASA Space Flight Live. It's our first show that we've done, so bear with us while we work out some of the technical difficulties, if there are any. Let me know in chat, do I have audio and video? And I guess this video is going to loop infinitely in the background. That's okay because it's an awesome video that Jack made for us. Uh, let me know right now, do I sound good? Can you hear me okay? Am I pretty? Tell me I'm pretty. Since it's our first show, we want to do a little bit of an audio check, video check. You're basically our home uh, mission control, honestly. You're our home production crew because of the way we do this and uh, who we are. We need your help. So again, it's the first episode of NASA Spaceflight Live. This video is just going to keep going in the background. Apparently there's supposed to be a little red bar below me here that's not in this scene, but eh, we'll switch to the other scene. Ah, uh, yes, coming through loud and clear, super pretty. Everything okay? All is good, beautiful, so pretty. All right, so I think we're good. Uh, with NASA Space Flight Lab, we're gonna be talking about a bunch of different topics today. And as you know, if you've ever seen me on camera before, I like to surround myself with people that are smarter than me. Joining me today, I have some friends. I have, actually, I think I like uh, I think I like this one better. That scene's better right there. We have Thomas Berghart over on this side. Thomas, how you doing? Hey, how you doing, Das? Good to be here. And we've got Chris Gebhart on the other side. Chris, how are you? I'm doing absolutely fine, Das. How are you? All right. So now I've got the background scene correctly, and, and once again, I'm sort of running everything and trying to put the great graphics on the screen and and all of these things. So again, bear with us. We're going to figure out exactly how to do this, uh, but we have lots of cool stuff to talk about today in terms of space flight. Uh, the agenda. As I rapidly try to clink, click over to my uh, information on what I'm going to talk about here, we've got some news on Starship coming up and lots of images and video to show there. We've got uh, a little bit of a discussion on COVID-19 and how that's affecting the world spaceflight industry. And we have a quick discussion on that Atlas V launch, AEHF-6. I don't have a teleprompter, so I have to I look over here whenever I read the next thing. Uh, we'll be talking about Atlas V AEHF-6, and then after that, the big news that just came out, Dragon XL. If you saw the news with NASA awarding a contract to SpaceX to deliver stuff up to that lunar gateway you may or may not love. But let's just hop right into it. Nobody came here to hear me talk. Uh, we're going to start off with Starship. Which one of you two nerds is talking about Starship? Uh, I believe I'm going to talk about Starship a bit, Das. Uh, <laughs> welcome, everyone. Welcome to NSF Live. New thing we're trying out. Uh, super excited. Um, we just want to talk about kind of the last week in space news. And everyone's the, the biggest thing, especially on the YouTube channel, has been Starship. Um, in Boca Chica, Texas, SpaceX has got uh, their brand new Starship SN3 vehicle, serial number number three, uh, stacked and ready to roll to the launch pad. Uh, this will be the latest Starship test vehicle that they're going to be using for test flights, uh, static fires, uh, fueling testing, all of that as they get closer and closer to suborbital test flights, orbital test flights. Um, getting their next generation Starship vehicle ready to go. Um, Starship SN3 has been stacked. Uh, it's fully assembled, at least the tanks are fully assembled. Um, and the next milestone we're looking for is for it to roll out to the launch pad. Um, we understand that that's going to happen no earlier than tomorrow. Um, they're currently working on rolling equipment, the roll lift equipment to the SN3 vehicle to get it to the launch pad. Um, and of course, if you've been following the YouTube channel, you know our correspondent Mary is down in Boca Chica covering all of that for us. She is currently out there, I'm sure, getting more footage of SN3 as we speak. Um, so we'll have more, for that, more of that for you guys soon. Uh, but that's the big next milestone, rolling to the launch pad. Um, the launch pad itself is also undergoing some preparations, um, getting all the ground support equipment ready to go for that. Um, and then once it gets to the launch pad, uh, they're going to have to do some more things. Uh, as far as we know, they haven't installed the Raptor engine yet. Um, so that's a big milestone. Um, and then once they do that, they're getting close to ready for its first big test, which will likely be a fueling test. Um, in the past, what they've done is they've filled the vehicle with fuel. And as soon as it is fully fueled or as long as that has gone well, they'll proceed into a static fire test um, where they fire the engine just briefly, uh, holding the vehicle down on the ground. 
Um, and that'll be a full up test of all the fueling systems and the engine. Um, we understand that static fire test is no earlier than April 1st. Um, and that's based on some public beach closure notices for the village of Boca Chica. Um, once that happens, um, and as long as that all goes well, uh, the next step will be actual flight tests. Um, and the past vehicles have done sort of short flight tests. We had Starhopper do what I believe was a 20 meter hop or 40 meters somewhere in that range. I forget the exact number, um, but a, a little short hop straight up and down um, before we proceeded to about a 150 meter hop. Um, and so we understand that we're not sure. We know there's a 150 meter hop uh, planned for no earlier than April 6th. Um, and again, that's also due to the same beach closure notices. Um, we don't know if there'll be an interim step. They might just go straight to 150. Uh, but all of those dates are very much subject to change, and I want to stress that. Um, all of this depends on every step along the way going perfectly. Um, and if anything has a little hiccup or they need to tweak some things along the way, all of these dates will move back a bit. Uh, but as of right now, uh, stag fire and 150 meter hop coming up for Starship SN3. Um, as far as we know, uh, only one engine for that test. Um, it's a pretty low altitude test, and just like they did for Starhopper, only one Raptor is really required for that. Um, we don't know if they'll need a nose cone. Um, again, pretty low altitude, not a whole lot of aerodynamics at play. Um, so they might not need to install a nose cone for that, but if they want some extra data or if the test profile is a little different, maybe they'll add that. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, if they do add that, it looks like they're going to have to assemble that at the launch pad because, of course, uh, in its current state, no nose cone is installed yet. Um, but then once they do that, uh, after they complete SN3 testing, they're going to go into SN4, which is the very next Starship. And for every iteration, they're refining their manufacturing methods, their assembly methods, um, and that uh, vehicle will be able to do even more advanced tests, higher altitudes, higher speeds, um, more engines potentially, maybe up to three engines would likely be the next step. Um, but again, all of this is very fluid. It all depends on what they learn with every test and every step along the way. Um, and the whole test schedule can change um, as they learn things. Uh, but right now, looking forward to SN3 starting the, restarting the Starship test campaign. It'll be very exciting in Boca Chica. Gotcha. And I am, so Thomas, uh, <laughs> again, y'all, this is our first time, right? Here's back to all three of us again. Uh, this is the first time we've done this. And so you were sort of talking and I was trying to rapidly swap pictures out and we haven't really practiced this much. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that I showed off all of the assets that we were supposed to be looking at while we were doing that. Do you have, do you have our, our Google Doc up that has the assets in it? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, um, was there anything in there specifically that you wanted us to show on the stream? I mean, I, I got, uh, I'm got i on the SN3 video right now, and I know right. we have this SN3, SN4 video that I think came out yesterday. Should we look at that real quick? Sure. All uh, right. I believe so, the video showed some pieces of the new Starship SN4. Obviously, they're building Starships before they fly the previous one. SpaceX likes to move quick down there. Right. Uh, but, yeah. And as, as y'all can see, as I, as I move a new asset over, since we're sort of, we have them sort of arranged, ready where we're supposed to talk, but uh, as, we, as we sort of talk here, um, I'm bringing another video up on the screen, and, and look at this nerd. We've got Chris Gebhardt. I'm actually going to roll this real quick because this is a... You're going to make a, me watch myself? Yes, I'm going to make you watch yourself. <laughs> and the, the thumbnail for this video is super awkward, I'm just going to say. It's nice trees in your backyard. Um, let's see how this is. Let me know if y'all have the video of this. But this is Chris Gebhardt, who's also over here, uh, talking about how we're able to continue cover what's going on down at Boca Chica. And then we'll discuss this a little bit. As a media organization, our first and foremost concern is always the protection and well-being of our correspondents, as well as following all guidelines and rules and laws that allow us to be an accredited media organization. In seeking to continue to bring you updates on SpaceX activities at their Boca Chica facility, we worked extensively with Cameron County authorities and local law enforcement to ensure that Mary had the proper credentials to safely and legally continue to perform her duties. We hope these video updates continue to be of benefit in these trying times, and we hope everyone is following the rules and laws laid down by local, state, and national authorities. And then we, we go into a bunch of video of uh, what's going on at Boca Chica, but Chris, what's going on with that? I mean, we know that Cameron County, Cameron County, which is where Boca Chica is, is currently under a shelter in place order where people aren't supposed to go outside because of COVID. Um, how, how are we still able to get video? How do we still know what's going on at Boca Chica? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, the, the main the main thing here is that each county, each state, as they've imposed these uh, shelter in place orders, 
has determined and made public in their orders which organizations, which, um, which businesses are considered essential. And media organizations are exempted from the shelter in place order as long as the, as long as they are an accredited media outlet and as long as uh, the person in question has a letter from the media organization in question confirming their assignment, confirming that they are actively working for the organization. So when we discovered this with Cameron County, we called the courthouse, we explained who we were and what we covered. We did not attempt to say we were just a blanket media or news organization. We were very clear that we were only space light uh, and that we had a reporter with us who was out at Boca Chica and inquired what the steps would be uh, if we qualified. And we did qualify as a media organization and we have followed all of the steps given to us by the courthouse and by the sheriff's department as well to ensure that Mary can safely and legally be out there continuing to film for us. And it is also worth noting as well that that's what she's doing right now um, for us as, as we speak live on the air, um, but also that it's a very secluded place where Boca Chica Village is. Um, there were only 12 people or 12 houses there max. Many of those people have moved away. Mary is basically by herself. Um, so she's sort of doing better social distancing than, than the rest of us are um, when, when she's out there because no one's around her. So it was important for us to make sure that she could safely do it as well as legally do it uh, and, and do her and perform her job duties for us. So that's how we were able to allow Mary to continue to provide the videos that uh, are the backbone of the video and multimedia updates on what SpaceX is doing at Boca Chica. Gotcha. All right. So I've got all three of us back on again, and I'm, I'm just looping the video in the background. Um, so it, we wanted to make that super important. Most of the time when you see these videos that are going up from Boca Chica, that, that Boca Chica gal Mary is getting for NASA space flight, um, it's a lot of time-lapse stuff. It's awesome pictures. You can sort of see what's going on. And for the first time, we actually had a face on the camera explaining what's going on, and we really wanted everybody to understand this isn't Mary sneaking out at night trying to get footage or something like this. We do have official permission from Cameron County. We worked with the proper authorities to make sure this was all all cool so that we could keep bringing this. And I think as of today, uh, we're looking like we're going to continue bringing video from Boca Chica, right? Yeah, that is Mary's correct. Um, yeah, and, and there are obvious safety precautions in place, as Thomas was just talking about, with the role of um, Starship SN3 after the launch pad. Um, you know, there, there are rules and guidelines that SpaceX is also putting in place uh, to ensure the safety of personnel and Mary as well uh, for that rollout. So she will, will be following all of those regulations and guidelines as well as the local authority guidelines. Gotcha. Thomas, do we know when that's happening? Has SpaceX said, oh, well, we're rolling it in a week or something like that? Like, what's what's the schedule on that? Yes. Yeah, so right now, no earlier than tomorrow is when we're expecting that role to take place. Right now, they're moving the equipment that they need to use for that role into position where the vehicle was assembled um, and preparing to roll it to the pad. But it sounds like no earlier than tomorrow as of right now. Gotcha. Uh, so stay tuned. Obviously, we'll keep you posted as far as that updates. But yeah. And if, if that thing starts to roll, Mary's going to be out there on the case uh, getting us some cool video of what's Absolutely. going on. Absolutely. Excellent. Just, hey, yes, I've, she will, as, as well as for the test flight as yeah. well. Excellent. I, I'm curious, is there something we watch for? Like, how do we know when it's going to roll? It's like, oh, well, they're putting it on the truck. It's going to roll. Is it like, what is Mary looking for out there? Do we know? One of these days we're going to have to get Mary on the show. <laughs> yeah, we will definitely have to get Mary on the show. Absolutely. Mary from Boca Chica. But um, definitely, obviously, the obvious thing is putting it on the truck, putting it on the roll lift that they use. Um, but there's also beach closure notices that they put out um, when they're moving. Uh, or well, beach closure notices are more for flights, uh, but road closure notices um, when they have to roll a giant piece of equipment like SN3 to the pad. Um, so that's the other thing she'll be looking out for and we're all looking out for. And that'll be another sign that they're getting close to moving things to the launch pad. Gotcha. All right. And as as we sort of continue again, uh, we're producing this live. It's not like we practiced it or anything. So I am sort of scanning uh, Twitch or Twitch chat. Oops, not on Twitch right now. <laughs> I'm scanning YouTube <laughs> chat to, to see feedback and stuff. I heard you that uh, Thomas's mic was a little bit low. So we were frantically typing over here to turn Thomas's mic up. And now, Thomas, your mic sounds great. Um, Chris, you're sounding good as well. I am watching. And so if y'all have some feedback or something, this is our first run at this. And I really appreciate everybody's sort of hanging in there with us um did we miss anything uh oh oh 
the super chats. There's a stack of super chats that have come in while we're talking. I'm not typically going to instantly interrupt if Thomas or Chris is talking, but let me see if I can run through some of these super chats real quick and just say thank you again. Uh, the super chats and the support, people watching us, people showing up when we start a stream is what allows us to continue doing this, right? And now we awkwardly have this in the background. So uh, <laughs> let me grab these super chats real quick. <laughs> Would anybody want to watch another video? I don't know. <laughs> this is, let's get all that stuff out of the way. We'll leave it on a tweet. Somewhere at the bottom of the stack, I have the actual show graphic. I think in the future, there it is. Okay, that's the show graphic. It's all of those recommended videos every space flight nerd gets on their YouTube recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> I've already got like 50 tabs open on the monitor that I'm using to show everything. So maybe next time I'll be a little bit better prepared. Hey, Ryan Ramirez, thank you for the two bucks there. Can't wait watching history, you said. Uh, we got two, uh, there's a, what is that? That's from Chris B.? We have, we have 1.99 curly L's from Chris B. I think that's his currency wherever he lives. Uh, what about it did 10... Curly L's, I love it. They're curly L's. He keeps talking about how much they weigh, and I'm like, I don't care how much they weigh. What can I get for them? <laughs> <laughs> we have 10 from what about it? What is up? What about it? There is another YouTube friend of the uh, channel, I guess. And those are some weird-looking E's. Don't forget to like and give coffee money for the crew. <laughs> Thank you for that there, what about it? Warhawk me with the five box. These guys rock. Henning, five weird E's. I'm just going to roll with it. Great work. Keep it up. Um, we've got Jack. Jack Buyer, what? Are you allowed to do that? Two dollars. Q covering twenty dollars. I'm not sure what a CHF is, but I appreciate the twenty of them. Uh, Jared Yock, ten dollars because you deserve it. Damn blessing. I guess we'll roll with that. Twenty. Is that the, it's the euros? If you have like the C that has some lines in the middle, that's a euro, right? Yes, yeah. that's the right. euro. Right. Yes. Thanks. All right. Um, and apparently, CHF is apparently a Swiss franc. So really? Thank you from Switzerland. All right. Thanks for the Swiss francs. We got oh, Big Gar with yeah. dreads, two dollars. Uh, Five dollars from John Binstead and. Uh, uh, that's UK pounds. Yes, I, I'm. I'm aware that the curly L is UK pounds. <laughs> I just call it a curly L. Anyways, hey, we're able to do this because y'all support. So thank y'all so much for uh, the super chats there. And again, if I don't read them out right away, that's okay. They're keeping a queue over here for us. Uh, you didn't come here to hear me talk, though. Our next topic that we're going to discuss is the impact of COVID-19. You know, the world is a I think it's fair to say a pretty scary place these days with what's going on with COVID-19. And uh, of the industries that are impacted, spaceflight operations, launches, preparing spacecraft, all that sort of stuff is definitely feeling a little bit of an impact. Different companies affected differently, but Chris G is going to do a little bit of talking about how the world spaceflight industry is doing with the impact of the coronavirus. Chris, take it away, dude. Yeah, so overall, the, the spaceflight industry is one that is not the most affected certainly by by any stretch um but you know since, since everyone is here primarily for you know the updates on on what's happening around the world with COVID 19 it is worthwhile to talk about because the guiana space center uh europe's launch port uh, that area in space uses is completely closed and will remain closed as long as the country of french guiana uh, continues to battle the outbreak and keep the curve low enough to not inundate their health system. So they are on an indefinite hold at this point um, at French Guiana. Rocket Lab has also uh, shut down and stopped operations from uh, the Mejia Peninsula on the Northern Island of New Zealand. Um, the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Kennedy Space Center, the Baikonur Cosmodrome uh, in Kazakhstan, and the Chinese launch sites are all still open at this time. Um, we believe that the Indian um, Space Research Organization's main launch sites with the first and second launch pads are closed as well due, due to that country's three-week uh, lockdown and shelter-in-place order as well, although we're waiting on exactly how the Indian launch market will shake out with, with the effects of this as well. Um, here in the United States, we've seen an impact as well. Um, SpaceX had to indefinitely postpone the launch of the SAOCOM 1B satellite uh, an, Ar an Argentinian Earth observation satellite because the Argentinian support personnel could not get here uh, and could not travel as needed to support the launch. So we've seen that one be delayed uh, already. Um, you know, we'll get to some of the larger corporations here in a minute, but right now the Baikonur Cosmodrome, the Russians uh, are, are continuing on track, although they have imposed um, some new security measures as well. They they have banned media from 
uh, the upcoming crew launch of Soyuz MS-16 up to the International Space Station to prevent unnecessary people being on base as well. They've altered around some of what the Soyuz MS-16 crew is and is not allowed to do. Some of these traditions that have been canceled stretch all the way back to Yuri Gagarin and the first human space flight uh, on, uh, you know, on April 12th, 1961. Um, so those are being uh, rescinded as well to help additional methods of protecting the crew. So in sort of a large global element, that's where we stand right now. Um, and we have seen more and more NASA centers as well here in the United States moving to what's known as stage four of the coronavirus preparedness matrix, which basically means everything at those space centers and space sites stops, except for any work that is needed to preserve equipment and life on the spaceport. So um, uh, the Ames Research Center, Armstrong, GISS, Glenn, Goddard, Marshall, Michoud, Plumbrook, Stennis and Wallops are all at stage four right now and, and essentially closed. The Kennedy Space Center and the Johnson Space Center in particular remain open right now at stage three, which is mandatory telework for all but mission essential personnel. And that's allowing some missions to, to continue processing uh, during this time. But, you know, it's, it's not just the Space Center closures that we've seen this effect on. We've also seen uh, an effect from COVID-19 on um, uh, on, on, on the commercial side as well, uh, most notably with Bigelow Aerospace and OneWeb. Uh, gonna start with Bigelow here. Um, so Bigelow is a company that is based in Nevada and they laid off all of their employees on March 23rd. Uh, now they blamed the coronavirus pandemic for it and they blamed the Nevada governor, uh, Steve Siskolak um, for the need to lay off their employees, though they didn't really explain why they laid off their employees instead of having them go to work from home. They didn't explain why that couldn't happen, and they didn't explain why they were blaming the Nevada government and blaming you know that for laying off 68 employees last week. And, and the reason I think this is very important to say that they didn't explain a lot of things is because Bigelow was already in financial trouble before the coronavirus outbreak and pandemic happened. Um, they are very famous for having the inflatable modules, um, one of which uh, beam is attached to the International Space Station. And they were very upbeat and confident when that happened back in, um, back in April of uh, 2016, when, when they launched that module and attached it to the space station in May of 2016. But then NASA, after that, put out a call for proposals for commercial companies to give bids and, and what do you want to add in terms of commercial modules to the International Space Station. NASA offered uh, $561 million in funding support for those initiatives as well. And Bigelow refused to submit a proposal for it, um, kind of balking at NASA's $561 million financial offer saying that they didn't think it was enough and that it was um, it was asking too much of them to commit to adding these modules. So they were already in financial trouble to begin with before this um, sort of unfolded. So corona blaming the coronavirus might not be completely true, but like I said, they haven't really stopped to explain why they wanted to blame that um, and point to that, uh, especially since they had laid off employees uh, the, in the previous week before Nevada went to its um, statewide lockdown and closure of non-essential businesses as well. But on on the flip side of that, one one company that that very clearly the, the coronavirus has impacted and, and is the reason why they've taken certain steps to, to scale back is OneWeb. Um, OneWeb has launched uh, two sets of 34 satellites on Soyuz launch vehicles from Baikonur so far this year. Uh, they were really hitting their stride in their production of their OneWeb internet satellites and getting them to Russia and launching them on the Soyuzes. Um, but while they were also doing that, they were trying to find additional sources of income. Uh, they were trying to find an additional $2 billion worth of investments. And um, unfortunately, the bank that they were primarily working with, that they had an agreement in place, but not a signed contract with, pulled out of the additional funding agreement. 
um, stating that it was, quote, the responsible decision not to invest further given the startup's high cash needs compounded by the global financial instability caused by the coronavirus. Um, and that bank pulling out with that particular statement that it was specifically because of the coronavirus that they were um, not going to provide the additional $2 billion of investments is why OneWeb had to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and lay off all of its employees except for those needed to keep the satellites that have been launched safe on orbit. Now, the unfortunate kicker here, uh, the unfortunate part of that is that while they were why they will maintain a, a staff to keep those um, satellites that they have launched safe up in orbit. They do not have enough of them in orbit to begin operational service. So there will be no cash flow for them. But the hope is that they will come out of this and come out of Chapter 11 uh, with no debt and restructured in a way that they can rehire their employees and continue forward. Um, and I want to jump back, having said that, that OneWeb, you know, could come out of this with the ability to rehire and continue on. And I want to go back to Bigelow because there's a lot of competing information out there with Bigelow, and they want to. Bigelow is saying that the layoffs of their staff were temporary, but the staff members who are talking are saying that that was not at all the indication that they got that they were basically told they they were fired completely and that the jobs would not exist when this was over. So some competing information out there about Bigelow, but uh, that's where we stand with those companies. The one bright spot in this that you could say, or the few bright spots are that um, some upcoming missions um, from SpaceX, um, the GPS-3 satellite launch at the end of April uh, is proceeding because that is a, a that is a mission deemed necessary for national security since the GPS-3 network will be used by the US military. Um, SpaceX also and NASA also proceeding with crew training and uh, hardware readiness for the Demo 2 crew launch of Dragon up to the International Space Station in May. That one would also be deemed necessary and be allowed to continue during this pandemic. Uh, and the Perseverance rover, Mars 2020, and this is the one that really makes me smile, is also uh, deemed mission critical because it, it has a 14-day interplanetary launch window in July that if it misses, it would have to wait 26 more months or two years and two months for the next Mars, Earth, interplanetary launch window to open. So gotcha. kind of long-winded there. That's um, okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but that's the, the, the sort of coronavirus breakdown of, of where everything stands right now around the world. Yeah, Chris, I've been trying to keep up with you and uh, people that are watching. You're like, what, what what graphic is that on the screen? So as you talk about different <laughs> things, I'm frantically trying to bring up tweets and stuff like that. And I'm like, wait, you're supposed to mention Tori next. And then it's like, <laughs> so everybody it, it, watching. It, it, was, it, it was fun watching your flailing arms because I tried to go in order of, of, our, of our thing. But then some things just made logical sense to like jump because I was already kind of Sanguing naturally into that. Yeah. But... So, so for, yeah, every, but... for everybody watching, this is not, this is the first time we've done this, and uh, we didn't practice it. We didn't say, okay, here's the exact script, and you have 30 seconds to say this, and then you have two minutes to say this. We're not overproduced, okay? And uh, we're talking sort of live, and as we're talking, I'm trying to bring up some visual aids and, and things, and we've got to sort of them set up over here, but uh, we're doing it live. So uh, bear with me as I try to bring up the proper videos, and you see my mouse on the screen and stuff like. Like that <laughs> we're doing okay so far right i, I think we're doing great i don't okay. know chat looks very engaged I, I'm, glad, I'm glad we have so many people here to watch this this is awesome <laughs> did we get any did we yeah get any? i mean go ahead there's a thousand six hundred people watching right now um that's that's awesome thank thank you all for, wow. for joining us live on a on a Friday evening, Friday night, Sunday morning, wherever you are around the world. What are they? Are like, they all stuck at home? So much. <laughs> they're all they're all stuck at home or something. I, what's your? I what's think we're all you? stuck at home right now, Doss. Yeah, <laughs> I think something's happening. Yeah, <laughs> something's going on. Um, there, were there any questions that came through while we were talking about the coronavirus in co coronavirus impact? Uh, I didn't see a lot. There was a lot of discussion about Bigelow and stuff like that. Um, how do we want to play that, y'all? Do we want to take questions on each topic? Do we want to get to the end? Again, we're making it up as we go. 
Well, I, I think we're definitely going to have a Q and A session once we get uh, through some At of these the topics. End, yeah. yeah so okay. You, so if you we'll... have questions, keep bringing them in. We, we'll we'll keep track of them. Gotcha. So so if you do have questions, I do see some questions scrolling by. Um, all sorts of questions about all sorts of topics. Again, we're oh we've already talked about a starship. What's going on in Boca Chica? We talked. We were just talking about COVID and its impact on the space flight industry. Uh, coming up, we're talking about Atlas V, that AEHF launch that went went off with fantastically. And Dragon XL is going to be the last thing we're talking about. And then after after that, in terms of like what's going on with the show, we'll do a Q&A session. That's probably the best chance for you to ask a question in chat and, and get it answered. So I do see questions scrolling by. I don't want you to think that we're ignoring things. Uh, I want you to uh, know that we will try to get some of those questions if you can hold on to them until we get to the Q&A section. That would be that would be great. And yes, you can put more pictures Apparently, in Apparently, I also dog. don't know what day it is. So, you know, <laughs> that, that's just, you know, coronavirus lockdown 101. What? <laughs> <laughs> you all can wonder if if I have on pants right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving right along, the next topic that we have here is uh, the Atlas V and AEHF-6. So let's go ahead and bring that up, and I will frantically scramble yeah. to put the NASA Spaceflight article up. <laughs> Who's on this one? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll follow the uh, the outline that we have, Doss. Okay, um, good, good. <laughs> this time for you. It's um, almost like I need a name next to each thing so I know who to expect to be talking next. Yeah, so yeah, so AHF6. Um, so this was a great launch from United Launch Alliance. Uh, that's a great picture that y'all are looking at that Julia took um, of the launch. Uh, so th this was one of those missions that... Um, had we been a little bit further into the pandemic and if we had base closures and, and things like that, this is one of those missions that would have been deemed critical to national security and would have been allowed to launch. Um, anyway, but we weren't there yet. So it was a normal launch. The 45th Space Wing uh, with Jim Williams did an excellent job of altering around the media uh, credentialing process and who was allowed on base to allow media to be there to cover it, but also maintain safe distances and, you know, follow all the CDC and, and, and national guidelines for how to do this. The the launch itself was was gorgeous, although I do have to say, standing outside in the middle of uh, Florida's summer, and yes, summer arrives in March in Florida. It's 92 degrees right now here, 92 Fahrenheit. Um, uh, you know, I was very... Uh, yeah, I, I was, oh, we'll get to that in a minute. You're, you're jumping ahead about this. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, this, this was a mission. Um, the countdown went absolutely perfectly without a hitch um, through fueling and, and everything. They, they were right on the money. And within 46 seconds of launching at the opening of the window, um, when a ground hydraulic accumulator malfunctioned, system malfunctioned, and that kicked them out of the terminal count at T minus 20, uh, at T minus 46 seconds. Uh, they ended up in an, about an hour and a half long, uh, hour 20 minute long delay as they worked to figure out that issue. Uh, they did, and of course, Atlas V lifted off, uh, absolutely gorgeous liftoff. Um, you know, one thing about the Atlas, when it's got five solid rocket boosters and those things light, that thing is out of there. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. it does not... Uh, yeah, it, it does. It does not hang around, and you can see in the video, Doss, if you can actually go back yep, a little yep. bit to, I got to it. the lift off. Oh yeah, um, it gets out of dodge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not only does it get out of dodge, but you can see how quickly it boom. I mean, how <laughs> how it just like pitches almost instantly once it clears. I mean, just look at that, like uh, of how it goes over. Like it. It's more dramatic, I think, with the naked eye when you're looking at it because you kind of hold your breath and you're like, ah, don't tip over. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, the thrust vector control on the Atlas is, is absolutely amazing. And, and the fact that it can do that with, all, with an asymmetrical thrust, too, because one side of it has the three solid rockets and the other side has the other two. Um, but it was an absolutely gorgeous liftoff um, of, of the... Of the of the rocket, um, Julia um, Bergeron got uh, some awesome and epic photos of, of not just the launch, but from her remote camera, um, her remote cameras as well. I simulated the trajectory but there. Was, the the dog, it's almost a like dog leg. Oh my it. gosh! <laughs> I, I love it. I mean, it really is uh, how that thing pitches over. But you know, the big highlight here, it was a success. It was a five and a half hour long mission. Um, it, it was not a. It wasn't a. 
a geostationary transfer orbit as we think of them with a very, very low perigee or, or proximity orbit to Earth of 200 or 300 kilometers. Um, this geostationary orbit was, uh, transfer orbit was much, much higher. The Atlas actually threw the uh, AEHF payload into a 35,786 by 10,500 kilometer orbit. Um, and that took five and a half hours to complete. Um, so the Atlas it did an amazing job, um, 83 for 83 uh, for its success record. And that's one of Julia's uh, launch pad photos from the remote cameras. I mean, absolutely gorgeous. I really like the backlight um, oh, yeah. of it and, and the silhouette that's created. I mean, that that's just so gorgeous uh, all around. Julia did an absolutely epic job. Yeah. Hey, Chris, um, can, can I ask here. you a question and, real and quick? It's worth, and it's worth noting that we, we, you know, we wanted Mary and Julia show, sort of on our first show because of what we were talking about in their specialty areas. But Mary's out filming for us right now at Boca Chica and... Um, Julia is actually a worker here in Florida who's considered essential for her job um, and is working right now. So we will have both of them on at a later date. But, you know, th that's why we're talking about Julia's work instead of having her on is because she is at work yeah. right, right now helping people through this crisis. Um, and another epic shot of, of, the, of, the, of the five uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne solid rocket boosters there. Just gorgeous. Oh, yeah. I've, I've been trying to bring things up. Dude, Chris, can I ask a question real quick? Um, yeah, I was a little sure. confused because I saw somewhere ULA tweeted something about 85 launches, but it's 83 launches. Do you, do you know what the difference is there? It's like 85 missions versus 83 launches or what? How does that work? Did you see that? Or am I just crazy? Uh, I did not see that from United Launch Lens. Um, this was the 83rd flight of the Atlas. Of the Atlas. Um, and it was Atlas Booster 86. So I do not know where 85 came from on yeah. there. Uh, Michael, Thomas, do you? I do not. I did not see that either. Okay. It could just yeah. be that I was like sleeping and I, I read the wrong number. Because at some point, I think on the webcast, I said 85 having seen a, seen a tweet somewhere. But it was it, it may be like missions versus boosters or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Well, well, be, well, but this was Atlas Booster 86. Yeah. So, um, so 85. To, yeah, no, because the, the Atlas, the last AEHF mission, AEHF 5, was the 80th. Starliner was the 81st. Um, Solar Orbiter was the 82nd. So right. yeah, AEHF6 is the 83rd. Yeah. All right, on the 86th booster. See, yeah. Th this is why I asked Chris, because he's like, well, this launch was this, and then this was this, and this was this. <laughs> he just rattles it off. Like I said, I surround myself literally with people that are smarter than me. Uh, continue on. Sorry for interrupting. I just I just wanted to see if I could ask that real quick. No, no, no. That, that was great. I mean, Atlas did its job. It, w it was mission success. Um, got the payload exactly where it needed to go. So they are now on... Uh, processing right now for their next mission and then we always love these shots right a very happy empty launch pad yeah we love empty launch pads happy <laughs> empty launch pads um at t plus because, something so, the empty launch pad is the best yes yeah. exactly <laughs> so you know you see the big uh crew access tower there to the right and you see the uh launch umbilical tower for the atlas there to the left uh, and that launch umbilical tower will now be hauled back to the vertical integration facility uh, where they will stack the Atlas for the, um, uh, basically, a, a, it's an Air Force mission. Um, and um, this is the space plane, um, the X-37B space plane uh, that will be launching next. Um, and uh, right now that is scheduled basically for, um, uh, for the May timeframe, although we're waiting on a specific target date at this time, but um, that's another one, a US Air Force mission that, that that's one that would also be deemed mission critical um, uh, for national security and would be allowed to launch if we get, as we move a little bit further into this uh, pandemic response. Gotcha. And everything. All yeah. right. And it's a, uh, yeah, it would be OTV6. Um, and the great thing about this is that um, that mission in May on the Atlas, while well, we're waiting for date, will debut a new configuration of the Atlas V. Um, the first ever five zero, uh, or no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm thinking of another one. Never mind. not a new configuration, but um, five meter payload fairing, uh, no solid rocket boosters and a single engine Centaur upper stage, which is standard for what the Atlases have have launched. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself in the Atlas manifest <laughs> this year. So was that apologies. the USSF yeah. mission that's gonna debut a new configuration? Yes, up in that's so. gonna debut the five the 511. 
Five yeah, one. That, that, yes, so and that's saw, the one I was thinking of. Yes. Wait, a yes, five one one. We saw Solar Orbiter, which was a four one one, and does that power slide yes. off the pad. So we're going to be able to see that now with a five meter payload fairing Atlas Five. Yeah. So slide. if we can, yeah. So if we can pull up um, the 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 um, the Atlas again from this mission that Julia got to us. Sure. Um, yeah, I get it. We'll because it will it will look ex the one that we're talking about later on in the year that will debut the new five. 1 1 configuration, it basically take off four solid rocket boosters um, from what you are about to see um, and, and just give it a single solid rocket. And that is what we're, we're talking about. But it's never flown, a single solid rocket has never flown with a five meter payload fairing before um, on the Atlas. So a, a new configuration debuting later this year. But yes, um, yeah, got a little bit ahead of myself. Oh, oh the that's okay. Of live broadcast. Like, Again, <laughs> we're doing it live. Anyone who's watched our live streams know. <laughs> knows this is what happens. There's so much to keep track of, and I love it. Like you get confused about what mission is what sometimes. I love it. It's, it's a good. A good it's a good problem to have. There's so much cool stuff happening in space. It's like, oh, let's talk about this, and oh, this other thing, and this other right. thing, and it, it's it's a good time to be alive. Well, I guess that's sort of really an interesting is. thing to say, but. <laughs> Uh, I do want to jump in because Kenji Okura in chat, thank you so much. We have found out what the 85 came from. The 85, oh. it, was UL, it was ULA's 85th national security mission across all of their launch vehicles. Gotcha. That is where the 85 came from for AHF-6. So okay. there you go. Uh, you so okay. It was one of their trivia thank questions you, yes. or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it was, go. okay. See, we need we need something with an eighty four in there, so we could have eighty three, eighty four, eighty five, and eighty six, right. and just really confuse us across we the board. We could be just yes. completely <laughs> confused. And hey, a couple super chats we missed. Uh, Dave Wolf, thanks for the fifteen bucks. I love all the coverage. It's one of the few things help keep, helping keep me sane during this time. So, Dave, us too. <laughs> we appreciate the support there. Red, thanks for the two CHF. Is what was CHF again? Swiss, CHS? Uh, the Swiss. Uh, the Swiss. Swiss Frank, yeah. Gotcha, Swiss Frank. It, it is like Swiss in Swiss language. Starts with a C or something? I don't even know what that stands for. Jared Yachts, $5. Coffee for DOS. Thanks. Thanks, Jared. And then uh, <laughs> High Grand Master Lord Zeronius, two ninety nine a dollar signs. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but High Grand Master, thank you so much for that. It looks like you had a question there about SN3. We're going to get to a sure. Q&A section at the end. And uh, we'll have oh, some... Actually, I'm oh, going to jump in because I can answer in. this right now because the benefit of being live, I can bring you some breaking news as uh -oh. it happens. I just got a note. It looks like they might be hooking up Starship SN3 to a crane, like right now. Really? Um, so when I said that it'll roll no earlier than tomorrow, which it, it could still roll tomorrow. Uh, maybe they're doing some testing or whatever. Uh, but we'll have some video and pictures coming for you from mary of course uh, but right now they're looking they're looking like they're hooking up starship sn3 uh getting ready to get it onto a roll lift and get it ready to roll to the pad um and then testing would begin like we said earlier no earlier than april 1st time frame for a static fire test um but we'll keep an eye on that and we'll keep you updated gotcha all right so uh as soon as we if we if we get anything posted like y'all if there's a tweet or something that comes up thomas chris people in the studio sure. and you want me to bring it up just just say like oh we got a tweet to look at it's breaking news i'm completely okay with bringing up breaking news like that as long as y'all are and 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 thomas a, a question for you on, on sure. this um so um they're, they're, as they roll sn3 out to its launch pad um is the engine installed in the integration facility or is the engine installed at the launch mount on the pad? Or uh, the right engines, the, however many they're going to use on, on right, this one. Right, yeah. Uh, we're, we're pretty sure, you know, single engine, for at least initially, um, we've seen them kind of evolve from a single engine to, hey, maybe we'll add engines afterwards after some initial testing. Uh, but there are no engines installed right now. Um, so if they're getting ready to roll to the pad as soon as tonight or tomorrow, um, it's going to look like engines installed at the pad. Um, and in the past, we've seen them do TVC, thrust vector control testing at the pad um, after installation, and then they move into fueling and static fire testing. Uh, but so engine installation at the pad, not yet. Gotcha. All right. So are we ready for our next topic here? You, you okay? I think so. You have like a Florida earthquake going on there, Chris? Or <laughs> I was uh, kidding. I you bumped guess, your laptop. Yes, I'm like... kidding. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know what you were getting into when you invited me onto this stream, right? Um, I did, and as soon as I did it, I was like, "Das is gonna come," and it's very shaky. 
That's okay. Hey, Alvin Forrester, uh, t-shirts win. Thomas Berghardt t-shirts win. Do you have like a t-shirt or something on? Uh, I, mean, I would, well, do. I don't know, but I, I don't know. At NASA Spaceflight t-shirts? NASA that might Space be something t-shirts? that like shows up in the future maybe maybe stay tuned a little bit for that maybe I'd be down stay i wore my, tuned, folks. my stay tuned mainsail hype t-shirt if there's any kerbal fans yeah. out there i today. mean i'm rocking a nasa space shuttle t-shirt right now i don't think it's what? on camera but you know gotta be dressed <laughs> for the occasion uh yes and high grandmaster lord Z- lord zeronius uh april 1st rollout are you sure it's not a prank <laughs> well you never know with spacex right uh <laughs> <laughs> if it can be memed, it, I mean, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we ready to go on to the big news about uh, this? Look, I'm not a very good weather person, but uh, Dragon XL, y'all ready for that? I would love to talk about some Dragon XL for a bit. So, if you were following along yesterday, we had some breaking news out of NASA and SpaceX. A brand. There's not every day we get news involving a brand new spacecraft that none of us have heard about before. Um, but yesterday, uh, NASA announced that they had awarded SpaceX a contract. Uh, to provide logistic services for the Lunar Gateway. Um, if you're not familiar, Lunar Gateway is the space station NASA has been planning for a little bit um, as part of their Artemis lunar program. Uh, and the Gateway is basically a staging point for our robotic and crewed missions to the lunar surface. Um, it's a pretty small station, not to the same size as, say, the International Space Station, um, but serves a similar purpose. It's going to be a platform for scientific experiments, research, uh, and long-duration human spaceflight. Um, but as an addition, it's going to be used to stage our missions to the surface and back. Um, and yesterday, NASA announced that SpaceX will develop a new spacecraft called Dragon XL based on their cargo and crew Dragon vehicles. Um, and they're going to launch it on their Falcon Heavy rocket. Um, and they're going to launch cargo and experiments and supplies to the Gateway um, to help support all of these missions, especially things like uh, soil sample uh, experiments and equipment. Um, things that needed to support everything we're going to do on the lunar surface. Um, now, this is a bit of a change because just a week ago, we learned that Lunar Gateway was no longer going to be on the critical path for a 2024 lunar landing. Um, they wanted to eliminate uh, technical risk and schedule risk. Um, so NASA decided, you know, Gateway is good. We still want to do it, uh, but it's going to be more of a long-term goal. Um, and it's going to be towards making missions more sustainable. Um, but for the 2024 landing to really get uh, the program started, um, it's not really needed. Um, however, yesterday, there's a, a big testament to how committed they are. They're still awarding contracts. Um, so Dragon XL, uh, from we only have one render of it, and it's on screen right now. Um, it doesn't look like a Dragon spacecraft that we're used to seeing. We've had cargo dragons and crew dragons, uh, both of which are kind of designed to be aerodynamic, uh, sit at the top of the rocket, not need its own payload fairing. Um, the, what we're looking at right now kind of looks more along the lines of a Northrop Grumman Cygnus style cargo spacecraft, more or less a tube with solar panels and thrusters. Um, so it's possible that this is going to need to be in a payload fairing on top of Falcon Heavy. Um, it's also possible that if you look at Cargo Dragon 1, uh, which its final mission is currently undergoing, um, sort of had a nose cone up top to protect that it dropped off during flight rather than a complete payload fairing. So there's always the chance they'll do something like that. Uh, we're going to have to wait for more news from SpaceX or NASA on how exactly that'll work. Uh, but it does look very different from Dragon. Some similarities that we can probably assume, uh, we have thrusters, of course. It's going to be needed to dock to different vehicles. Um, pretty safe bet those will be Draco thrusters, um, the same thrusters that the crew and cargo Dragon spacecraft use. Um, it also ha- share the same docking interface that all of the U.S. spacecraft use at the International Space Station and Gateway. Um, same uh, docking adapter as Boeing Starliner um, and as uh, Orion, the Orion crew spacecraft. Um, so that'll be similar, and these are all hardware that they can bring over from the Dragon program. Um, also, it's going to need solar panels. Perhaps it'll just use the Dragon solar panels. Again, the power uh, needs may be a little different, so they might need to make them a little bigger or something. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but those are all pieces of hardware that they can bring from the Dragon program, and that all minimizes the research and development they have to do to develop a brand new spacecraft like this. Um, but yeah, launching on Falcon Heavy, uh, and that's at least two new Falcon Heavy missions on the manifest. Um, the current contract guarantees at least two missions per provider. Um, and I say per provider because NASA hasn't specified how many providers will support the Gateway Logistics Services Program, the GLS program. Uh, it's poss- It's looking like they're going to try and get multiple providers, just like they did for the International Space Station. Right now, we have SpaceX, 
uh, north of Grumman with their Antares and Cygnus spacecraft. Um, and we're also about to bring on Sierra Nevada Corporation with their Dream Chaser spacecraft. And that'll launch on a United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket. And all of this is done to provide redundancy in case a launch vehicle or a spacecraft develops some issue or needs to be grounded for any reason. We're not risking losing science or cargo capacity for the International Space Station. So NASA is going to look to do the same thing for Gateway. Um, so this is the first provider they've announced, uh, SpaceX for Gateway. Uh, but it's definitely uh, to be expected that more providers will come on board. It's also completely reasonable to expect it'll be more than two missions per SpaceX. Um, it just guarantees at least two. Um, but the contract allows NASA to order missions for up to 12 years. And they're saying that it'll be one cargo mission per crew Orion mission. Orion launched on the SLS rocket. Um, so if we're talking about approximately at least a one-year annual launch cadence, it'll be 12 missions over that time frame. Um, so definitely probably going to be more than two uh, space missions. That's just what we have so far. Um, and more providers coming on board. So potentially more new spacecraft uh, launching on some of the new heavy lift rockets that are coming online. Um, hey, Thomas, uh, yeah. one quick second here. Um, I, there's all sorts of questions. And as I'm trying to sort of read chat, uh, do we know anything about uh, what they're doing with Falcon Heavy here? Is it like, are they going to expend Falcon Heavy? Are they going to reuse it? I mean, I think there's no official answer yet, right? Nobody's nobody's really said what that's going to be, is there? Right. We don't have a whole lot of information. We're kind of going off of one big NASA press release that they announced, hey, this is what we're going to do, but the details aren't really there yet. And it's definitely possible that this is still uh, partially in development. So there's a lot of right. question marks, even on the SpaceX or NASA side. And um, a lot of speculation. Do, you know, like People want to want right. to guess what's going on, right? Right. Gotcha. The spacecraft is based on Dragon hardware. Um, and we know that it's designed to be able to deliver at least five metric tons of cargo to the gateway. But those are kind of the only specifications we really have. Right. Um, we know, based on the render at least, it's the same diameter as a Falcon Heavy second stage, because uh, that's the render we were given. Uh, but we can't really deduce mass figures or anything, or Delta V figures from that. Um, so it's hard to say what exactly Falcon Heavy is going to be needed to do. Yeah. We know they have lots of options. All of the Falcon Heavy missions so far have had the, the side boosters returning to Cape Canaveral, landing on landing zones one and two. Um, and then the Center Corps has been landing or attempting landings on a drone ship out in the ocean. Of course, I still love you. Um, however, now on the East Coast, there's now a second drone ship. Just read the instructions. Uh, we haven't seen it used over there yet, um, but it's we believe it's important getting ready to support that role. So they'll have a second drone ship. And we know Elon Musk, SpaceX CEO, has hinted at a third drone ship in the near future. So, and that drone ship, I believe, is going to be called a shortfall of Gravitas. Um, so that's three drone ships two ground-based ground -based landing pads. So there's a lot of options that SpaceX can take uh, as far as depending on what the performance requirements are needed for these missions. Uh, the other thing we have is the caption in the NASA press release stated that the render was of the, uh, the Dragon XL spacecraft being deployed from Falcon Heavy in high Earth orbit. Um, what we're going to infer from that is it's probably going to be put into an elliptical orbit. If you look at the Indian moon mission that just happened not too long ago, the name of which I'm going to not try and pronounce because I know I'll get it wrong, <laughs> but that the launch vehicle deployed the lander into a very elliptical orbit, which meant the lander only needed a little bit of delta V to get the rest of the way to the moon. Um, I think what we're looking at is a very similar thing with Dragon XL. Falcon Heavy does as much of the work as it can, get Dragon XL as close as it can to a translunar injection, and then Dragon XL will use its thrusters to inch its way into the gateway's orbit and make that rendezvous. Um, so we kind of that's the idea we have of the launch profile, um, but it's gonna we're gonna have to wait and see about mass figures and exactly what the delta V requirements are uh, before we know what kind of stage one recovery effort SpaceX has. There's also always the possibility where they really don't have the performance to land the rockets. Um, so there's always a chance of maybe making the center core go expendable or something like that. We're just going to have to wait and see. Gotcha. All right. And while you were talking, I was sort of, uh, you were talking about using the existing Dragon technologies and stuff like that, right? And so I had up the the cargo Dragon and the crew Dragon and that sort of stuff as we were, as you were sort of talking about the differences. But I really wish we got a little bit more than this render, right? <laughs> yeah, I, de I definitely do too. But I, I, de I doubt we won't be getting any new stuff from SpaceX. I'm sure as we get forward, we'll get some brand new pretty renders and eventually photographs of hardware. And I'm looking forward to seeing what this is going to look like. Yeah. So, so in the render that I've, I've got the, the 
Dragon XL rendered on the screen right now. Which is it coming or going? It can barely decide. Like, is that right. the, the end of it? Is that the trunk? The solar panels are at the back. Is that the front? Because it's got the. Do you? What do you think it is? It looks weird because most spacecraft you would are deployed from their upper stages with the docking port facing forward. But if you look at the render, right, the side of the spacecraft which is facing the upper stage really looks like a docking port. Right. Um, and it's got thrusters all around it. So it's, This is it the upper looks... stage, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think what we're looking at is the spacecraft kind of launching upside down, in a sense. Um, and maybe that's just a matter of the mass distribution. If the docking port and the thrusters need the weight to be closer to the bottom, that's a thing that might be considered. Yeah. Um, but, th but there's... Well, we don't know. We might have to wait and see and wait for a press conference where we can ask some more questions about yeah, this. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, but yeah, it definitely looks like it's launching differently than most cargo spacecraft we know about. It's a very Kerbal way to launch. Like, sometimes you can't yes. quite get it to fit the way you want, and so you flip right. it over backwards, and you launch, and you have to flip That's all of a sudden. Just gonna, I was just going to say, like, I've launched several things upside down in Kerbal because <laughs> they just wouldn't fit any other way <laughs> in the main yeah. the, the fairing ends up looking like this in Kerbal if you try to launch it that way, right? And, right. and if you flip it over, it launches a little bit better. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we have uh, these new Falcon Heavy missions. And I also wanted to point out, because we, and we ran an article about our... Um, that's this Dragon XL announcement. Falcon Heavy is no stranger to heavy lift and deep space missions obviously it's demo missions send a tesla roadster out to deep space um, and as we understand it the gateway itself is going to have to be launched by a commercial launch vehicle that's what nasa has been directed to do and and there's going to be at least two modules the power and propulsion element which was awarded to maxar um, and the halo the habitat uh, module i don't remember what halo stands for it's Habitat something, uh, awarded to Northrop Grumman, as we understand it. And both of those modules are going to have to be launched by a commercial launch vehicle, and Falcon Heavy is certainly going to be a candidate for that. Um, so Falcon Heavy might have a pretty key role in the Artemis and Gateway programs. Um, so, and that's going to be even more launches to come up on the Falcon Heavy manifest. Gotcha. And I, I brought up that render of Gateway as you were talking about different mm -hmm. modules and stuff like that, different parts that would be launched. So. Excellent. Oh, there we go. So, Michael says habitation and logistics outpost. There's the full name of the habitation module. There you go. Thanks. The Michael. halo. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's always good to have somebody in the background sort of helping out with stuff, isn't it? Surround yourself with people smarter than yourself, right? <laughs> you can keep saying that. I, that is my favorite <laughs> thing to say. Um, again, I do see questions that are sort of scrolling through chat. The way we're sort of running it this time, this is our first time, so we're figuring it out live. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, and that would be the right time to ask some questions. I don't want you to think that we're ignoring the questions. We're trying to get through the topics, and and then uh, do a little bit of a Q&A. The other thing to mention, we originally thought this show was going to be about an hour long. We've been going for an hour and we're halfway through the content. <laughs> So, <laughs> I don't. I think that's a good problem to have, honestly. Um, so we planned that well. Like... <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And Chris, all right, I'm going to say this. Chris, um, you can just ask questions too. It doesn't have to be me. Like, if you have something that you think of, just sort of toss it in. I know that I talk a lot. <laughs> that's why I'm here, but feel well, free so to do, jump so... in. Well, so do I, to be fair, and I was, I was just trying to respect the who's the host. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, we're not really no, produced. But, uh, but, I really want it to be we're hanging out and we're talking about cool space stuff here. So I'm just the guy that's pulling the levers and stuff. Perfect. But, Go ahead. So, so Thomas, what, 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 one thing that sort of sort of hit me with, with this, you know, SpaceX has the was the one that won the first Gateway Logistics contract. Um, we know the commercial element to this in terms of the, the launching of the gateway elements themselves. Um, but we obviously don't have launch vehicles yet for those. What right. I'm just curious, like what, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, do, do you think NASA would put out requests for proposals and go with who comes in cheapest with each proposal? Or do you think they might do a like, Hey, if it takes six launches to build the gateway, you get three and you get three. Sure. You know, I, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot to consider, especially when you're talking about uh, modules of a gateway, which is such a high profile NASA mission. Uh, when NASA goes and procures launches, there's a lot of different requirements they have to look at. They have to look at, uh, does, first of all, does the payload have any specific requirements? Does it need to be integrated vertically for some reason? Does it have extra uh, materials on board that are extra hazardous that need to be taken care of? Um, and different providers have different ways of dealing or not being able to support those kind of missions. Um, so that's a big factor. Um, and then, of course, another factor is cost 
vehicle performance? Does simply does the vehicle have enough fuel and delta V to get something uh, to its destination orbit? Um, so there's a lot of factors that come into play. But you bring up a good point where if there's a set number of missions that they need to get the gateway into its orbit, get cargo to the gateway, get crew to the gateway, etc., and they want to split all that up for redundancy purposes, there's definitely uh, an argument to be made for that. Um, as far as going for RFPs, I think it'll be probably similar to the way NASA procures most of their missions. Set out, you know, these are the requirements for the mission. Send us, you know, what vehicle can support this mission and what the cost for that would be, um, and any other information they need from that, and they'll make the best decision from there. Um, but if there's multiple missions, I could definitely see them splitting it up for redundancy purposes. Um, and there's a lot of different vehicles to choose from. You have Falcon Heavy. You also have the currently flying Atlas V vehicle, which is, of course, proven very reliable, has a nice big payload fairing when you're talking about launching things as big as, you know, uh, station modules, basically. Um, and then you have new gen, next gen vehicles coming online. You have ULA's new Vulcan rocket. You have Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket. You have Northrop Grumman's new Omega rocket. And then all of these have big heavy lift capabilities that can support things going as deep as lunar orbit. Um, so a lot of different options and a lot of different factors to consider when NASA makes those decisions. So it's it's gonna have to we're gonna have to wait and see a little bit. Yeah, I think one yeah, of the most. Do you think this is a... go 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 go? No, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean it, it's it's a kind of short question. Do you, do you think this is might be something that SpaceX, I mean, give, given the mass of some of the gateway elements, would potentially propose a fully expendable Falcon Heavy? Uh, I think it's to definitely get the contract. A you know. Right. You know, if if they can do so at a cost that's still competitive with whatever the other providers offer, that's definitely something they can offer. Um, they've shown that they're very willing to go expendable for their big customers. We've seen them go expendable for the very first GPS mission. Of course, the next GPS mission will go to drone ships, so a little bit of a change there. Um, but for especially for their big customers, when you're talking about the Air Force, Space Force, NASA, um, and even their commercial customers, commercial satellite customers, if the mission requires it, they'll go expendable. Um, and that's definitely something I don't see any reason they wouldn't offer that to NASA. Um, so that's another option that they have to offer, and it's they'll they'll do whatever best fits the needs of the mission. Cool. All right. I think my comment was going to be, I think one of the most exciting things is talking about all the different companies that will be involved with putting things together, right? And this sort of came out of the blue, this Dragon XL thing. It was like, whoa, wait, what? Right. And I sort of feel like there might have been a little bit of a, a, a sea change when it comes to Gateway. Once SpaceX and Falcon Heavy got involved, I want to see Falcon <laughs> Heavy launches. And it's like, oh, all right, Gateway. That sounds good. I mean, I'm not well, going to pretend know, I... I... Go ahead. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, you know, like, you know, for the last two weeks and everything we've been hearing about Gateway being taken off the critical path and everything like that, I mean, to those of us who have been following the, you know, and reporting on the space program for years, that is usually the telltale sign that something is dead on arrival. Right. You know, when you remove it from the critical path. And then all of a sudden, SpaceX gets contracts. Yeah. That's the article <laughs> I just brought up. to resupply it. So it's like, oh, yeah. I guess it's really not dead. You know, right. like, yeah. I mean, this news a is a week thing. ago, right? March 20th is when we put the article out, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and there's a big thing to be said, you know, every time they award a contract, every time they announce a new partnership, it kind of becomes harder to cancel the program. Um, so, and it's, it's reassuring to people who want to see this program succeed as they get more things done, as they announce, hey, SpaceX is going to handle logistics for us. That's another thing. Check, check that off. Um, we're looking ahead. Eventually, they're going to have to start awarding contracts for the human landing system, the actual lander. And when that happens, that's another big step like, hey, Artemis is happening, you know? Yeah. Um, I also mm -hmm. wanted to point out a question that someone just brought up. Uh, do, Raj Luthra, uh, do you think the Dragon XL would use electric propulsion or solar sail technology or a combination of both? And I'm going to answer this because it's one of the few things I think we can infer from the render is that uh, neither of those is going to be used. A solar sail is pretty unmistakable. Yeah, right. uh, if, right. if it was going to use a solar sail, we would have seen that in the render. Um, we can look at the solar panels that look roughly the size of a dragon solar panels. Um, to use electric propulsion, something like hull thrusters that Starlink satellites have been using, um, or at any sort of ion thrusters that the power and propulsion element is going to use uh, when it launches, um, you need lots of solar power to right. support something like that. And dragon solar panels are not big enough to support that on their own. Um, so I think it's safe to say it's going to rely on more conventional uh, propulsion, things like the Draco thrusters. I don't see anything that looks like a super Draco thruster, though that would probably be overkill anyway. Um, so it's pretty safe to say uh, neither of those in play. 
um, at least initially. You never know. Future evolutions of vehicles always change things. But right now, I, I don't see either of those involved. Gotcha. And, and I'd be hard pressed to figure out how solar electric propulsion, uh, which is really the only one of the two that that's viable in this, um, a solar cell is not viable for the right. types of maneuvers you need to do to get to the the rectilinear halo orbit that the gateway will be in. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I, I'd be hard pressed to see how conventional chemical propulsion isn't the most efficient way to get to the gateway right now. Yeah, and it reduces another technical risk when every time you bring in new technologies that haven't flown as often. Um, solar electric propulsion is more or less proven, um, but but every time you add a little bit of extra technical risk, again, the whole reason they moved Gateway off the critical path, they're trying to reduce the schedule and technical risk to achieving this 2024 landing goal and the goal of sustainable landings on the lunar surface. It'll be hard to justify that if you're bringing these extra uh, technologies on board. So I think I think Jericho thrusters are the way to go here. Yeah, that, and then the other yeah. thing, a, a difference between the two is uh, the timing, right? When you have one of the solar electric propulsion elements, that usually means you're taking your time getting somewhere versus the chemical rockets, mm -hmm. the Draco thrusters and stuff like that. Uh, if you've played Kerbal, right, you put an ion. I, I keep saying Kerbal because <laughs> that's what I do. You put in a little <laughs> ion thruster and the thrust is so low, it mm -hmm. takes you forever to do burns. And that's just in a video game, right? Um, right? So I wondered both the proven technology and the fact that, you know, what's the mission? How quickly do they need to get stuff there? Can they afford to be going up for 60 days and burning this this uh, ion engine or whatever? Um, I think that well, that Especially makes when you're carrying food and science experiments right. and everything like that right. right you want to get there as quickly as you possibly can with with those things as as well yeah, yeah. so I, I think that's a lot of uh, great discussion on that we'll, we'll take some questions on this as well at the end of the show which we will reach at some point i think um but are we ready <laughs> to go on to astra well Chris? well i can help us there we, we need to end we, we need to reach that end by 1900 edt so, okay. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. So we've got 50 minutes. Like. Give me your best Micro Machine Man uh, impression of Astra. What's going on with Astra? Yeah. Uh, this was a sad one. Um, this was a sad one this week. Um, Astra had the little company that that could, you know, um, the only one that made it to the end of the DARPA challenge um, and and everything like that. They. They were another one where they got down within 53, 52 seconds or something like that to lift off um, on the last day of the challenge. And they had a technical snag in their guidance and navigation system that got them. So they didn't win the DARPA contract. They didn't get all that money, but they were still going to continue forward. They kept everything at Kodiak Island, Alaska. And unfortunately, the day before they were supposed to launch when they were doing a, um, a basically, you know, a, a a, a, a launch practice, uh, a countdown practice and liftoff practice uh, run. Uh, the the rocket basically exploded. Um, the, the the rocket had a rapid unscheduled disassembly on the launch pad. That it, now that is not stated definitively by anyone, but you know it's pretty easy to infer that when they said the area is highly contaminated, it's still contaminated hours after an incident occurred. And that the launch is completely canceled. Right. That doesn't sound um, like a small leak. If, if, no, like if a component had broken, if something had leaked, had leaked, leaked. Oh God, English. Um, <laughs> moving on. Um, um, you, you know, we, there would have been talk about a delay. You know, sending the payloads back to the customers or things like that. And outright, and the launch has been canceled because of the anomaly. That, you can pretty much infer that the thing exploded on the launch pad, right. which is sad. Um, I mean, Astra had really done an amazing job here of meeting the extended deadline for DARPA. And I mean, it's, it's, it's sad. They have other rockets. You know, I, 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 this is a company that I think we, we haven't seen the last of um, in terms of what the U S government really wants for the, uh, r very quick and rapid access to space for small satellite technology. Um, a little more rapid and flexible than, than what rocket lab is doing. Although rocket, the rocket lab is very, um, accessible in, in, in that realm, but like the U S government wants to be able to go to Astra on April 1st and say, Hey, on April 15th, we need you to launch from Kodiak. Yeah. That's sort of their and thing, right? To be able to do like that rapid. Yeah, very rapid. That's very, thing. very rapid. Like, like a couple of weeks of notice, you know, from the government is is 
sort of what 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 it was in that ballpark um you know and and we never wish anyone ill in this business um and and ruds especially ruds on the pad are are horrible but the good thing here is no one was hurt no one was injured no one was killed uh the pad was evacuated um at the time um but you know we we wish them well in their recovery gotcha yeah all right so something to be said because the astra was named one of three right Astra kind of leaned into yes. like hey this is the right. first orbital attempt uh decent chance it goes wrong um I, I think mm -hmm. I think I agree with you when you say not the last we'll see of Astra gotcha yeah excellent yeah. does that and I mean a, a good a good thing to note here too just just really quickly is that this rapid use launch pad that you're looking at right now it's not a launch pad that we actually think of as a launch pad that, that has all the infrastructure there and is static. All of that is, is taken up there by semi trucks and air cargo runs. Um, so that is not a physical launch pad like a SpaceX pad, like 39A at the Kennedy Space Center, like the Baikonur launch pads are. Uh, this is all mobile, very mobile. So this did not destroy the standing launch architecture at the Pacific Spaceport Complex in Kodiak. So um, that is all fine and separate from from where Astro was launching from. Gotcha. Yeah. I hadn't really looked at that. It's it's like there's two telephone poles in a in a chain link fence. It's not a bunch of concrete yes. structure <laughs> and a tower and it's it's literally a telephone pole with a light and an antenna mm -hmm. on top of it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the rocket is literally transported up there in a in a cargo container a, that like you would see container. on a shipping. Yeah, yeah, a shipping container. Yeah, like that's how they get all this there, and that's part of the rapid response because they want them to be able to not just be able to launch from Kodiak, but from Vandenberg, from Cape Canaveral, from from Wallops. You know, they 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 want the launch location to also be very flexible. Right. What made Kodiak the choice for this one? is because it offered the most flexibility of any of the ranges um, right. in the United States. Not a lot going on out there. <laughs> not a lot goes on out there, exactly. <laughs> Can I put exactly. it that way? And, and it, yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I was trying to find a, a, a different way of saying that, but you're exactly <laughs> right. Like, not a lot launches from there, so they weren't in danger of, like, overlapping with a Northrop Grumman Cygnus launch to right. the station or, you know, good Lord, the 50 missions that are scheduled this year out of the Cape, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gotcha. So that sort of wraps up Astra, and I think the last thing we have on the agenda here, and I am I am watching the clock. I don't want to be that guy, but I'm I'm watching right. the clock. Um, the Crew Dragon parachute failure. So I don't yeah. I don't even know if that title is correct. Parachute uh, failure. It, it's a little mis it's a little misleading. We gotta edit our outline. A yeah, little, yeah. Little Thomas, bit, yeah. take it to, away, dude. I'll jump into this real quick. Um, Basically, uh, Tuesday, uh, we heard about something going wrong with a SpaceX uh, parachute test, uh, but it's not really s safe to say a parachute test failure. Right. Or, or it's, not, it's not safe to call it a parachute failure. I guess it's safe to call it a test failure. Uh, basically, as we understand it, and this is from a statement uh, that SpaceX sent out to media, um, they had planned to conduct a parachute drop test. As you know, they've been working with NASA to certify the new Mark III design of their Crew Dragon parachute. Um, this is the parachute design that will bring astronauts safely home at the end of a Crew Dragon mission. Um, and they had planned to use a helicopter to bring this uh, spacecraft-like test article up to altitude, drop it, make sure the parachute's deployed properly, all of that. Um, unfortunately, uh, while the uh, helicopter was traveling to the right test conditions, um, the load, the test article underneath the helicopter became unstable, and the helicopter pilot decided out of an abundance of caution for the helicopter crew and everyone involved uh, to emergency release the payload. Um, due to this, it wasn't at the right test conditions yet, it wasn't at the right altitude or anything yet, um, so the parachutes weren't armed. Um, thus, the parachutes didn't deploy, and as a result, uh, falling into the western u.s desert the test article was lost um most important thing out of, to come out of all this of course no injuries um the only thing lost was this test article you can always build new test articles um and also for the broad scheme of things this was not a failure of the parachute system the parachute system wasn't armed yet um this was a problem with the setup of the test um which is has much smaller consequences than hey, if we had conducted a parachute test and the parachutes literally failed to deploy, we have to look at the design and figure out, hey, what, what went wrong here? Um, that's not the case here. Um, so according to NASA, 
still on track for a mid to late May launch of Crew Demo 2, which will be the next space flight of Crew Dragon. So they're not anticipating any impacts from this test. Obviously, they'll have to go redo it. They still want to complete this test program, uh, but they're not anticipating any big schedule delays or anything from this. Um, to date, SpaceX has already completed 24 tests of the Mark III parachute, according to NASA. So they're well in well into this test campaign, um, and hopefully no big impacts from this uh miss set up uh parachute test that happened this week gotcha and i'm gonna i'm gonna bring this up i was rolling the uh the spacex parachute yeah. test video and there were a couple different ways that these parachutes were visualized mm -hmm. being tested and we were talking not about this dropping out out of the back of the c-130 like this right this right, test no, was we're talking under about a... that sky crane helicopter I believe, yeah let show. me see if i can find that i think it was yeah there it is right there so what we what our understanding of what happened here was that the parachute, or not the parachute, the, the payload was lo slung underneath the helicopter. And if that thing starts to swing, the helicopter can only right. take so much before it right. becomes a danger to the crew of the helicopter. And yep. so, correct me if I'm wrong here, but our understanding is this started to become unstable. Perhaps it was moving in an, in an uncontrollable, or a, a close to uncontrollable way. And the helicopter pilot, or someone on board the helicopter, decided to drop it. To cut it is that did I explain that correctly? Yep, that's exactly right. the The pilot was the one in control, and the pilot is the one that initiated the emergency release. Um, and it was due to that. Yeah, the tester goal kind of hanging below this helicopter right. uh, became unstable for some reason or another. Um, and it's all, all about protecting the crew. You know, right. the crew of the helicopter is more important than any piece of test hardware you can make up. You can always build new uh, hardware. Yeah. Um, you can't, it's hard to re harder to replace humans. Uh, we need to keep the crew safe, and that is exactly what they did. Um, and that's mo that's what's most important. Yeah, absolutely. Like my understanding was that it, it, it's not even something was wrong with the helicopter, or it's not like somebody forgot to put a pin yeah, in we, or we anything like that. We don't know like the that. exact cause of what uh, made it go uh, sort of into this uh, unstable right. configuration. Right. Uh, but, but it's something to do with how they set up the test. Gotcha. The day, it may have just been well, wings you know, these... that they went through. Go, Chris. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, like the, the, without having a lot of it, like speculation is. I mean, it's important to note that right, we're we're kind of providing here's what some of the possibilities are. Right, right, right. Because I think we all remember that viral video from 2019 of the rescue, the helicopter rescue, the paramedic rescue in Arizona, where the poor person and the stretcher just started spinning oh, yeah. underneath the helicopter uncontrollably. Right. right. How many paramedic? You know, how, how many paramedic? pickups and drop-offs do they do do we do every single day around the world right you know and then and then one by happenstance because of a perfect you know combination of things ends up going awry you know right. so without any information you know like it's important again to just note we're, we're providing you with what the most likely possibilities are right. for, for what happens yeah, yeah. With, without the official information we have no clue what could have happened with that uh might have been a shark <laughs> Sorry. Shark, Sharknado disrupts Crew Dragon. Testing. Google that as fast oh, as I could. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, that's okay. good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> that the, the picture was tiny. I apologize. The picture was tiny. <laughs> Um, so that, uh, that sort of wraps up our topics there that we were talking about. Let me bring back over this way and hop over to this screen. Uh, we talked a little bit about Starship. I'm going to give you, give you a recap of the topics, and now we have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Um, so we talked a little bit about Starship, what's happening out there at Boca Chica, and specifically how we can continue to keep up with Boca Chica, even given the restrictions in place with COVID. Uh, we talked about COVID as well, how that impacts the spaceflight industry. Right, we've got uh, that successful launch, Atlas V AEHF, launching that military communications satellite. The Dragon XL was big news. SpaceX awarded the contract for taking stuff out to the Lunar Gateway. Uh, Chris G was telling us a little bit about what's going on with Astra, that unfortunate anomaly. And then we finished up with the Crew Dragon parachute test. I'm, I'm going to need like a neck brace looking over to read this <laughs> thing. Maybe we should have it up on the screen. Uh, but we were just talking about that Crew Dragon parachute test issue. So if I'm not mistaken now would be the good time if you're in chat and you have questions for us um now is a good time to talk about that and i want to grab this really quickly 
all the super chats that were coming in while we were doing discussions. Again, I'm not breaking in talking about super chats, but we are able to do this because of your support. So Ron Smith, thank you for the two dollars there, talking about the trunk on the Dragon XL and some forum information, I guess. Um, we also had Ron Smith with more information on Dragon XL. Uh, Betting the, the Dragon XL is similar to their Lunar Lander proposal. Thanks for the ten bucks there, Jonathan Hammond. Ten curly L's. Love that NASA Space Flight's doing a regular live stream. Great to have interactive discussions. So that's the part we're getting to now. So much going on at Space Flight. Really appreciate you in the troubling times. Uh, let's see if I missed any. I don't want to miss any. Sometimes I do though. Doug. Doug. Doug, I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the 279 Canadian there, uh, the super chat as well. So thank you all so much for the support. Now is a great time to start asking those questions. And we're going to try to do this every single week. We may have different hosts. We may have different guests on every week. We, we're hopefully going to get better at it. But uh, now is a great time to ask questions. And I will ask you this. It's easiest yeah. for me. Well, I think. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I, yeah. I, I just wanted to pause right there and, and say that, that, that yes, you, you kind of went very quickly past, I think, what the biggest point of this is. The, the, this live show, I think we kind of forgot to talk about this at the beginning. Right. This isn't a one-off. We, we want right. this to be a weekly, a, a weekly series. Um, obviously, probably won't do 52 episodes a year um, because there will be times when some of us are on vacation. You know, um, and, and we will be taking like a, an odd week off here, but this is going to be a weekly series. Um, so th this is for us to present what we think is, are the big, you know, stories of the week or, or the lesser covered stories of the week, but also the chance for you to ask your questions about anything like we do on the launch live streams. When I say it can be about any launch, but, you know, this really can be about anything. Yep. Um, so this is your time to really ask questions, or if you want us to deep dive into other topics gotcha. to, to let us know what you want us to be working on for future shows as well. Just wanted to clarify that. Also. Yeah, no, thank you, Chris. I, I appreciate you yeah. there. I know that I tend to rapid fire information at people. <laughs> it's my style and I talk very quickly. So I, anytime, I absolutely thank you for the help there. Um, so I was going to say, if you do have a question, it may be the best for us if you tag at NASA Spaceflight in YouTube chat. That'll at least help bring my attention to the questions as opposed to just random statements and, and chatter and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm just going to go through, and I do think we might need to lightning round some of these, trying to keep our explanation or our answers mm -hmm. a little bit shorter. Um, but let's see here. If we grab something... Here's one from Matthew Pryor. This is a good one to start. Dragon XL. Do we think Dragon XL will be reusable and how? Who wants it? All right. Uh, I'll take it. Um, I, again, we have very limited information. We kind of only have the one render, uh, but it looks nothing like the Dragon capsules we've seen so far. It doesn't look very aerodynamic. It doesn't look like a capsule shape that can survive re-entry and be stable on the way down. Right. Uh, the requirements for the mission require that it autonomously dispose of itself from the gateway. It's unclear whether that means it has to literally be disposed, you know, either destruction on the lunar surface or some graveyard orbit or something, or if an autonomous uh, disposal could mean, hey, come back to earth autonomously right um but from the render i am going to speculate that it's not going to be reused it doesn't look like something that'll have parachutes and come back to earth um orion has a little bit of down mass capability when it brings its crew back so any uh experiment supplies or anything like that that needs to come back can probably come back that way um i don't think we're going to see a reusable dragon xl right in, in one, one quick comment on that uh remember if you're taking cargo out to the moon and then you want to recover that you have to carry your parachutes and all your recovery and whatever your exactly. heat shielding is and stuff so that's going to increase the non-fuel mass which is going to decrease your payload going up to the moon so you may be able to stretch that payload to the moon by not worrying about recovery ability there right exactly gotcha okay so i'm gonna keep going with questions um there are so many good questions there's no way we're gonna get to all of them uh i'll take this one myself question when is the next great nasa space flight event and uh we like chris was saying we're going to try to do this every saturday right every saturday I think so. Yep, okay, Saturday cool. at 5 p.m. Eastern, yep. And currently we do not have another launch broadcast or anything like that, another launch live event this week. There's no launches scheduled for this upcoming week, correct? Uh, correct, well, yes. We're, we're going to have to keep an eye on the new Starship developments. Right. Starship is doing things all the time, so you never know about that. Keep tuned for that. Yes. Uh, but yeah. Gotcha. So in terms of live True, events... But I, but I would I would argue that they're not going to make april 6th for the test top so i don't think we're gonna Chris, have you're not being optimistic enough we have to go on elon <laughs> time here okay <laughs> 
<laughs> so no live event schedule. Yeah, me and my realism. Like, yes. <laughs> but continue to watch the NASA Space Flight channel here. You know how to get back to a channel, yes. like, subscribe, whatever. Um, because just about every day we're expecting videos from Boca Chica, whatever is going on mm -hmm. out there, right? So that's mm -hmm. a good question. Um, scrolling on down here, let's see what else I have. Wow, there are a lot of questions that have come in, and i got to go find one. So reusable, we got that one. How's the progress with SN4? That sort of ties into what we were just talking about. What Do we know about anything SN4 uh, we, related? There's some hardware available. If you look at the most recent video from Mary on the NASA Space Flight Channel, there's some rings, uh, stainless steel rings for SN4 uh, out and about. So they definitely started making parts for it. Right. Um, I don't believe we've gotten to any stacking operations for SN4 yet. Gotcha. Um, so, so a little bit of they started. Building some stuff, but not starting to Lego it together yet or whatever, right? Correct. Gotcha. Let's see here. Uh, do we know if SpaceX will use B1049 on the next Starlink mission? And double, like, try again for uh, a fifth we, replay? We do replay. not know what the booster assignments are for the Starlinks. Right. Um, because we... the Starlinks are kind of like, the Starlinks are all the in-house things, right? So the trick with the Starlink schedule, the trick with what booster is going to be used for Starlink, you know, here and there, is that they're always going to be shoehorned in between the other missions, right? Right. They're never going to delay a paying customer mission for an in-house Starlink. And one reason that the booster use schedule here, aside from the GPS mission and um, Demo 2, which have allocated boosters for the Air Force and for NASA, the booster schedule can kind of flip around if customers don't care if they're on a new or a, a flight-proven booster. And with Salcom out of the picture now indefinitely until the coronavirus pandemic is, is dealt with to an extent that it's safe to travel, there's kind of an extra booster sitting there that was ready to go at the end of the month. So right. it's a little impossible for us to say what booster they're going to opt to use here for the next start. Mission. Gotcha. Sometimes we know what the booster, like the, the core number is when we're setting up remotes and somebody takes a picture of the booster and it's like, okay, there's the number, the little number on the side of the booster. Somehow, sometimes that's how we Correct. find out the booster number, right? Right. Gotcha. Um, have we have, do we have any confirmation on that Starlink landing failure? Uh, was that due to, did, did SpaceX ever officially come out and say that that landing failure was due to uh, the engine failure, the sort of puff we saw during the ascent? Uh, we don't have any official word on that. Uh, that investigation is likely still ongoing. Uh, just this week, NASA joined the investigation team. Um, obviously, they're very interested because... No, sorry, they, they've been a part of the investigation from the very beginning. Or we, I think we heard this week, but yeah, since the beginning of the investigation. Yes, right, gotcha. NASA would always be involved. If any of their launch vehicles uh, have some sort of issue during flight, NASA is going to be involved in that. Um, we, we don't have any confirmation of the outcome of that investigation. It's likely still ongoing. Um, all we know is that they had an engine failure during ascent. We can see it right before Miko. Right. Um, and we don't know if that's tied to the landing failure. Um, we do know that this was the fifth time this booster was flying. Um, and Elon Musk on Twitter did mention that this failure isn't very surprising, given how much strain this booster's seen over its lifetime. Um, but it's too early to conclusively say that that's the reason, right. um, which is exactly why NASA is going to want to be in on this and say, hey, what if this engine failure didn't have anything to do with the fifth reuse? This is something we definitely want to definitively make sure um, what the problem was. And if it, it can if they can tie it directly to a fifth reflight issue, um, like, hey, it's seeing a lot of fatigue over these flights or something like right. that, um, it's a lot easier to continue the launch campaigns for rockets that aren't on their fifth flight mm -hmm. while still investigating, like, okay, how can we make this rocket more reliable on its fifth flight, stuff like that. Gotcha. Uh, but right now, no official and, results. And, We're going to have to stay tuned. And, it, and it's worth noting very quickly that... Um, the Starlink recoveries and landings of, of those boosters are pretty much at the maximum limit of what a booster can do and still be recovered. Um, so there's basically no propellant margin left at all. Um, right. and, and, and the fact that it had to burn a little bit longer, right, and engine wear and tear, you know, these are all things to sort of bear in mind uh, with, with that particular landing failure. Gotcha. All right. And I am, there's and so many good questions, y'all. There's so many good questions. There's no way that we're going to be able to get to every single question. Um, here's a sort of big uh, one. There's one right. Oh, go ahead. There's yeah, go one on. right now that I can take that's really quick to, to sure. answer. Uh, Ron Smith was asking us, um, has ULA announced which flight of the Atlas V it, when, they was, when they will switch from the Aerojet solid rockets to the Northrop Grumman solid rocket boosters? 
The answer is no. They have not said the specific mission on which they will switch, but Corey Bruno did confirm that they will make that switch this year. If I were a betting person, I would say they're not going to make that switch before Perseverance launches to Mars. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> uh, considering that's the next one with solid rockets, since the one in May is, is a no solid rocket mission, I doubt they're going to debut brand new solid rockets on an Atlas with such a critical mission. Right. Um, so I would assume a mission thereafter. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. So that was Ron Smith, right, on that one? And then, hey, TW, yes. I saw the super chat in there, 20 Knox. No clue where that's from, but I appreciate the 20 in OK. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the Starlink 5 engine failure and in sort of the landing and stuff like that. So uh, those are sort of the still li waiting for more information on that. I appreciate the super chat there. Here's here's one. And we'll try to do this one really quickly. Uh, there's sort of some conflicting information. There's Gateway which has not in the critical path. And then there's Dragon XL, which is supplying Gateway. Chris and Thomas, what do y'all think about the likelihood of Dragon XL actually being a thing if Gateway is pushed back, not in the critical path? Uh, well, like Chris mentioned, uh, whenever a program kind of becomes, oh, it's not on the critical path anymore, or it's on the back burner in a sense, that's kind of NASA speak for this program might get canceled in the near future. Right. Um, but on the flip <laughs> side of that, like you said, when they announce something like Dragon XL, that's the thing. Oh, well, clearly they're taking this program seriously. They're awarding launch contracts to help support this mission. Um, kind of hard to say. I think that as soon as a launch contract is announced for the Gateway modules themselves, that's a big sign like, yeah, Gateway's safe. Gateway's going to be a big part of the Artemis program. And of course, once that happens, you're going to need supply vehicles. So that's a big uh, support for the Dragon XL program. Yep. Uh, but we might have to wait and see a little bit. Yeah, Chris, how you feel? Same. Could not have said. Could not have said it better myself. Gotcha. Yeah. Here's one. Do you believe that a 2024 moon landing is still feasible with all the new events? And I assume the new events there would be a uh, coronavirus, a big part of it. Do we think that coronavirus um, may have an effect on a moon landing? Oh, um, well, it definitely could. Um, I, I, I need to back up and answer, <laughs> answer sure. the question a slightly different way first. Natural schedule slips and trying and, and anything with human, you know, uh, humans on it, whatever that date is that they give you, add two years at least to do it. Right. <laughs> um, I, I don't think 2024 was in any way realistic from the beginning. Not that having deadlines that you're trying to meet and aggressive deadlines that you're trying to meet is a bad thing. Right. Just the reality of this is that the deeper you get into the design iterations and the actual build and testing of hardware that's needed for things, not just like the lunar lander, but the, the spacesuit. Right. I mean, the spacesuit mock-up looked really cool and kind of weird, um, <laughs> admittedly, but, um, you know, you know, in terms of what we were used to with other spacesuits, but, you know, you're always going to run into things. Um, and, you know, not just Orion, not just SLS, but everything else. I, I don't think right. 2024 was realistic to begin with. Stuff um, happens, right? So, right, because stuff happens. But but now what is happening right now, very concretely with the coronavirus stand down, nothing is happening with the core stage of SLS for Artemis 1 at Stennis. Uh, no, no work is happening on the second core stage for the Artemis 2 mission. Right. Uh, the first crew flight. Um, absolutely nothing is happening with that. Nothing is happening with three. Uh, work on Orion is kind of still progressing, but has ground to a halt, especially in Europe with the European service module for that. You, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that has ground to a halt. Um, and I know this is a somewhat frustrating answer to the person asking the question, but it's kind of it's kind of a very legitimate we don't know right. um, because we don't know how long this is. these shutdowns are going to last in the United States um, because unlike other countries, we, we are not even close to our peak yet right. um, in terms of cases, in terms of infections, in terms of lockdowns, in terms of all of this stuff. We, we, we are very, very early in this and right. we don't know what the full effect is going to be yet uh, on that. But I, I would almost certainly venture a definite yes it will have some impact we just don't know exactly what that is yet right gotcha all right and i think we probably have time for one or two more i'm scrolling down again we know that there are so many great questions uh as much as we'd like to basically just live here uh, we also have other things going on i know personally <laughs> i'm taking some time away from the family they're hanging out over there chris i know you have stuff going on as well uh thomas can we just leave you here for a few hours you can just do q a <laughs> 
Oh yeah, I'll just sit here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll just go ahead and read YouTube you, you, chat you, you, and Chris. You, you, uh, we'll say, but, no, but, um, but, but you know what? What 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 I will, what I what I would offer to this is that if we don't have a chance to get around to your question, you know, my DMs are open on Twitter at Chris G underscore NSF. You know, you can you, su su if we don't get around to answering them, submit them to us because we will answer them even if we can't get to them or run out of time to get to them online you know so, and, and right. thomas i'll let you speak for yours as yep. well thomas you burkhardt on twitter feel free to send us a message send us a tweet uh i try to answer every question i get on twitter so absolutely if we don't get to it let us know uh i'll my i'm never leaving my phone so yep. i'll see your tweet and i'll try to get answered best i can yep and i do live streams and, and, and on what, twitch what, as what's well. your handle oh uh tg mets fan 98 um is my twitter handle if you're looking for that on twitter right yeah and yeah, and, and 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 for those and for those wondering it's a pretty good it's a pretty good thing that he said mets fan because <laughs> if he was a yankees fan this boston fan in him would those oh, two be some interesting car rides down to the cape yeah <laughs> I, I, I suffer enough as a mets fan so we don't have to oh, there you go <laughs> i feel the same way as a boston fan most of the time <laughs> and i'm so if you have questions uh if i don't answer questions i do a lot of kerbal stuff right so i live stream just about every day of the week over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash dasvaldez. So if maybe you don't have space flight questions, but you have questions about Kerbal Space Program, which Quick Plug was free to play this weekend, still free to play tomorrow as well, uh, you can find me over on my Twitch channel too, and I'm live just about every day asking live questions. Now, some of those questions and, and, I may have to Doss, ask actually, them <laughs> where to get them. Yeah. But, but, but Doss, I, I want to pause there and, and, and kind of pimp what, what we do a little bit more because you, you did a couple of really good like Q&A shows this week with Kerbal Space. Like talk, like talk a little bit about that because those were really fascinating to watch and have on and as I was working. Well, I know I, I knew there was a whole, uh, there's a ton of people that are stuck home. There's especially families with kids that, that are looking for stuff to do. Maybe they need a break from something and they want something that's educational or maybe STEM content or something. So all this week I was doing Kerbal Help Desk. And for at least four hours a day, I would just fire up my Twitch stream and literally answer Kerbal questions. And it's everything from which engine should I use to how do I encounter Elu, right? Uh, so we were doing a live help desk trying to give some people that were stuck back at home more information on Kerbal Space Program. And it was fortuitous that this weekend, the powers that be at KSP decided to make it free play on Steam. So you can go to Steam and just download it for free until, I think it's Monday morning. Um, there are so many people that were sort of showing in new faces just asking Kerbal questions. And I like Kerbal questions. <laughs> <laughs> so last question here. Um, let's grab this last question, and then I'm going to ask for some feedback from people in chat. Dragon XL, resupplying the gateway. What about Starship? Is that going to mean they're not going to do Starship anymore? Is that going to take money away from Starship? Are they going to just say, oh, we don't need Dragon XL. Let's fly Starship instead. What do you all think about Starship versus Dragon XL? Um, so I think it's definitely a sign where you have to look at what NASA is going to be comfortable with and how far Starship development is along the way. Um, right now, Starship is a test vehicle that they're testing down in Boca Chica. Hasn't gone to space yet, hasn't gone to orbit yet. Um, and for something like getting a NASA launch contract, you need to demonstrate that this is going to be ready at the time you're, that NASA is going to need this to launch. Granted, Dragon XL hasn't flown either. Dragon XL, we just learned about this yesterday. Um, but it's based on heritage hardware from the Dragon spacecraft, which has flown many times. Um, so it's probably easier to reduce schedule and technical risk for a Dragon XL versus convincing NASA, like, hey, we want to use this brand new Starship vehicle launched on this brand new super heavy booster with this brand new Raptor engine. Um, there's a lot more risk associated with that kind of system versus a proven Falcon Heavy rocket and a spacecraft based on a lot of heritage Dragon hardware. Right. Um, so I think that would have been the biggest thing to take away from this is space, Starship isn't going anywhere. But Dragon XL is going to fill a need before Starship is ready to support the kind of role that Dragon XL is filling right now. Right. Chris, do you think money from I Dragon mean, XL is, is good for Starship or is it going to take focus away from Starship? I don't think it'll take focus away from Starship um, at, at all. I mean, the, this pace at which uh, Starship development is going at is, I mean, is, is, is obvious to anyone who's watching all right. of our YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the fact that they've blown through SN1 and SN2 and are now on SN3 in four weeks. Like, you know, like, um, uh, no, no and, I, and it won't take money away because cause remember, SpaceX, the, Starship is an internally funded thing with right. SpaceX. 
um, and or largely internally funded, right? It, it, but this this is meeting a NASA need, right? And, and part of this contract and part of what makes it so intriguing to to have these statements and why Thomas and I were so surprised at gateways off the you know off the um, the critical path, but then all of a sudden we get this contract is that that contract 100% included the development funding for this new Dragon XL vehicle, right? right? This isn't something that SpaceX would just go, oh, we'll build it for the heck of it. You know, toss it together uh, real quick, whatever, money. yeah. You know, like, no, that's not what this is. This is a very calculated thing of how do we continue, right? Because one thing Gwen Shotwell is very, very good at doing is balancing the forward-looking elements at SpaceX and what they're doing internally with where the need of the market is. And the need for the market with NASA right now that they are not currently serving is the resupply element to the gateway. Right. And if that means bidding and designing a new vehicle and committing to Falcon Heavy launches, go for it. Gotcha. And that's exactly the right move. The flip side of that, though, is that I, I just kind of want us to think about this for, for, for just a second. This is the gateway, the entirety of the gateway. The massive 15 foot by 13 foot room that I am in is Starship. Right. Starship's overkill. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but but Starship is, is is overkill. And there are things that Starship will be overkill for. Right. Right. And and it's just not the most logical thing to use when you strip away the fact that it hasn't flown yet. Right. right. You know, which is a huge element of it. It's it's but almost it's, like it's how many gateways overkill. would you like to deliver to the gateway? Like <laughs> Well, I, yeah, kind of exactly. I mean, yeah. heck, they could probably hold hold the launch the whole thing in one go yeah. in, in, in a starship. Um, I've done that with the International you, Space you know, Station but, and Kerbal. You <laughs> have, and it freaked me out, Das. You have, and you showed it to me live on the air, and it freaked me out. Um, <laughs> Sometimes you just need it in order. But, but anyway, I, I yeah, but you know, like th there there are things of like yeah, like Starship can replace a lot of things, right? But there are also other things it's just not the best suited thing for right now could it potentially be utilized in some sort of landing capability on the moon right well of course you know um but you know it's it's about looking at where these things are in reality and balancing what you need and it's important to remember that this is all the current state of play of things Right. A couple of years down the line, if Starship's flown some demo missions, flown to orbit a couple of times, maybe even gone to the moon once or twice, and NASA says, hey, you know, we, we've got this gateway station that you've been supporting for a while. We're looking for more launch contracts to keep supplying that. And SpaceX goes, well, this Starship vehicle has turned out to be pretty affordable and it's actually cheaper than launching Falcon Heavy rockets. Would you like to use this instead? Very real possibility. NASA says, sure, right. it might be mm -hmm. overkill, but if it's cheaper, they might just do it anyway. And it's it's not it's too early to rule out in the future that starship fills a role mm -hmm. that dragon excel is going to fill more in immediately right um but you're right right now it'd be a little bit of overkill um and it's just not ready to support that role right now right gotcha yeah and and you know it's it's important to to say too that you know nasa is not uninterested in starship you know they have the unfunded agreements um st study agreements with spacex mm -hmm. for how starships how Starship landing on the moon would, would actually work in terms of its interaction with the lunar regolith um, and the lunar topsoil right. and everything. So, so NASA is interested in Starship. You know, NASA as a taxpayer organization, a taxpayer funded organization that is using government and taxpayer money always has to be a little more cautious than private companies are, right? So while SpaceX says, yeah, this is what Starship's going to be able to do, a lot of NASA's calculus in this is yes and that's great but you got to prove it to us right you know gotcha well y'all i think we've uh we plotted for a one hour show and we've been going for one hour and 45 minutes now <laughs> never get a bunch of space nerds talking about space they won't shut up it's such a bad problem well, to have, you know right? we, we we can count down to a specific time we're just horrible at keeping to yeah. a time after that countdown is done you know like it's not like we're launching rockets to space or anything we don't have to end at exactly <laughs> t minus show plus 60 or whatever uh but i do believe that that is going to bring us to the end of our very first NASA Spaceflight Live uh, here on YouTube. Chris and Thomas, thank y'all so much for joining me today. That was a fantastic time. Thank you, Doss. Pleasure. 
All right. My absolute pleasure. This was awesome. And yeah, I can't wait for the next episode next week. Cool. And thank and... you for everyone who tuned in. Over a thousand of you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. And hopefully, you guys will come back next week. We'll have, sure we'll have a whole new week of space news to talk about. Yep. So. And, and that's that was my thing here uh, for the outro. We're going to go ahead and roll that cool video that Jack Byer made for us. But uh, I'd love to see some feedback in chat. And I will go through and copy all this chat out. If you thought there was something we could do a little bit better, if you have just feedback, you did a great job, that DOS guy needs to get a haircut, like whatever, <laughs> put it into chat for us. We will read it because we want this show to be something we're doing on a regular basis next saturday right guys oh I'll, I'll, I'll be here all next right saturday yep but we will definitely be looking at your feedback um over here in chat i will read it we'll copy it we'll talk about it as a nasa space flight team uh, but for today we're going to go ahead and spool down nasa space flight live and uh i mean my outro is see you later nerds um do you guys have outros uh, I like long and prosper and <laughs> long and prosper. stay safe. <laughs> All right, so we'll roll this uh, video one last time, and we will look for y'all next week. Remember, in the meantime, like and subscribe the channel here. You can get Boca Chica updates just about every day. But for now, this is NASA Space Flight looking for the proper video to play in the outro. Where'd it go? It's gone. It's I lost it. Oh, here it is. All right. <laughs> Later, nerds. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Let's get some, actually I have to scroll that back and then turn the audio back on. Thank you.